This program is made possible in part by a grant from the State Journal Register, the oldest newspaper in Illinois, and by the individual members of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. From Sangamon Auditorium on the campus of the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois presents the 2006 Convocation and Investiture of Laureates, Profiles in Excellence. A pastor whose ministry of presence has helped thousands of people in need. A physician educator who founded a school of medicine and changed medical education forever. A business executive who leads by example in civic involvement and philanthropy. A scholar and writer who has helped shape national discussions on political, social, and religious issues. And brothers whose unique collaborative style has made them among today's most important abstract artists. Since its first convocation and investiture of laureates in 1965, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois has recognized more than 200 people who have brought honor to their state in the spirit of that most famous Illinoisan, Abraham Lincoln. As laureates of the Lincoln Academy, each person represents a lifetime commitment to leadership and service to humanity. The mission of the Lincoln Academy is to uh, continue the legacy of Abraham Lincoln by finding worthy Illinoisans to uh, receive the Order of Lincoln, which is the state's highest award. It's to thank them for what they've done for the community and also to encourage others to emulate what they have done in their own lives. Personal success is always an indicator of someone striving to do well. However, it's not the things that we look for as the attributes for the receipt of this award. Uh, they have to give back to the community in significant ways in order to, uh, to receive the legacy of Lincoln through this award. The Lincoln Academy of Illinois was patterned upon the learned academies of Europe. It is unique among the 50 United States. Members of the nonpartisan, not-for-profit academy are appointed by the governor, who also serves as its president. Each fall, the academy meets to select the laureates who are to receive the Order of Lincoln Medallion the following spring. The state's highest honor for individual achievement, its colors of red, violet and green symbolize the state bird, the cardinal, the state flower, the violet, and the leaves of the state tree, the oak. In addition to its laureates, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois also recognizes future leaders by honoring the outstanding senior students at each of Illinois' four-year degree-granting institutions in ceremonies held each fall at the old Illinois State Capitol. We regret that the president of the Academy, Governor Rod Blagojevich, is unable to attend this convocation. In his stead is Colonel Jill Morgenthaler, the governor's deputy chief of staff for public safety and homeland security. I now ask that Mr. Ernest Wish, a laureate and regent of the Academy, read the citation for laureate Reverend Thomas J. Behrens. Mr. Wish. Born in Hinsdale, Illinois, Reverend Thomas Behrens is the founder of the Knight Ministry, a non-denominational, faith-based, social service organization that since 1976 has nightly given hope and help to the marginalized residents of many Chicago neighborhoods. That first night, 30 years ago, Reverend Behrens was the Knight Ministry's only minister. Working in the Lakeview neighborhood, he expected that he would be counseling adults who were homeless or working late night shifts, and he did. But he found a disturbing number of homeless, troubled teens as well. Leading an expansion that continues to this day, Reverend Behrens soon had more night ministry volunteers and staff on the streets after dark. Today, they reach out to men, women, adolescents, and children in 10 neighborhoods in Chicago. Runaway teens, addicts, the working poor, the chronically unemployed, the lonely, the medicinally underserved, all have a friend and advocate in Barron's and the Knight Ministry. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Reverend Thomas Barron's. We come to each one of these sites twice a week. 
uh, th this particular time, uh, it's, it's at 7 o'clock in the evening, but we'll go till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, different neighborhoods, different populations. And we've been doing this for a long, long period of time, and people have a lot of confidence in us. It's 7 o'clock on a Tuesday night in Chicago's Humboldt Park neighborhood. The evening is just getting started for the staff and volunteers aboard the Knight Ministries Mobile Health Outreach Bus. Six nights a week in 10 Chicago neighborhoods, the blue and white bus is there to provide medical care and testing, counseling, coffee and sandwiches, and most of all, hope to citizens who in many cases have been forgotten by society. The Knight Ministry is a ministry of presence. We have a nurse who's a nurse practitioner, very skilled. We have a doctor who supports them, and uh, they do a lot of health care. But they also meet folks and say, where'd you sleep last night? What are you doing about that? Uh, or if you have the flu, how do you take care of yourself when you're out on the street? And it's not just taking care of the illness, but what's, what's happening for you as an individual? And so the nurse is there, but we also have counselors who, who meet folks we do a lot of HIV testing. The Knight Ministry was founded in 1976 by the congregations of 18 Chicago churches. Tom Behrens was a member of one of those churches. Summers spent volunteering at a settlement house, inspired him to go into social work. He had earned master's degrees in social work and divinity and spent three years as a mortgage banker to get a better grasp of how to develop low-income housing. In his first months on the job, he was struck by the loneliness of the people he met on the streets night after night. And that loneliness can really be, you know, it's, it certainly is a drag on an individual, but it really gets them into the depth of who they are. And, and it may lead to drugs as a way of covering up the loneliness. It may get into sexual dysfunction uh, or abusing folks uh, in some kind of way. And it's, it's sort of covering up loneliness and uh, if you can develop relationships that are sincere you can maybe address some of that and and that certainly was was one of the things that struck me early on. Reverend Behrens was especially concerned about the many homeless youth he encountered on the streets. One of the kids sat me down and said you know well, let me just tell you my life story and he did from the time he was like five years old until he became homeless as a, a teenager, and uh, at the end of the conversation he said, we need your help. We want your help. You need to reach out to us. Reverend Behrens developed a foster care program for homeless teens and followed that with the Knight Ministry's Open Door Youth Shelter in 1992, the only shelter in Chicago that takes pregnant and parenting teens as young as 14. Now we are taking in 16 kids uh, along the way, and we've probably sheltered, you know, 2,500 kids along the way. And uh, so that shelter from 1992 to the present is about 14 years old, and we're uh, starting this new shelter uh, very soon, and we'll do a trans transitional living program as well, adding eight beds. This is the, uh, the eating space for the 16 kids who will stay here for about four months. And uh, we have a, actually a, a restaurant type uh, of uh, stove. In addition to the new transitional home for youth, the Knight Ministry also administers the Youth Shelter Network, a collaboration of social service and youth shelter agencies that work to provide safe places for homeless and at-risk youth. Since its founding 30 years ago, with Reverend Behrens as its only staff member, the Knight Ministries programs now involve hundreds of people. We uh, have four to 500 volunteers who come on a regular basis, but there's other volunteers who might just help once or twice a year. We have an 80, 88-year-old woman who goes out at least once a week for us on the bus. With, with, without those volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do as much as we can, we can do, and so the volunteers really are important for us. The Knight Ministries Outreach Bus is a welcome sight around the city's poorer neighborhoods, where it provides counseling, health care, and a generous dose of hospitality. The bus accounts for more than 60,000 contacts with the public each year. We go out in, into people's neighborhoods, into their neighborhood. It's not our storefront or whatever, but we go into their neighborhood. It could be their living room, so to speak, and we take experts out there. We don't have 
people coming in to see the experts at our, our shop. We, go, we take the experts out there, whether it's counselors, whether we do case management. That's just another way of meeting folks, and it's meeting people maybe at the bottom line of, of uh, the community. And, uh, and we see them and uh, help as many of them as we can. A third of the Knight Ministry's budget comes from government sources. Foundations supply another 40 to 50 percent. The rest comes from individuals. It's a constant challenge and more needs to be done. One of our, our sort of dreams is to develop a training institute for doing street outreach with folks. Develop a curriculum in terms of folks. How do you go out and say, the first thing you have to do is be present. Get to meet folks. Get to know the community not just the, the, the folks that you enjoy, but you need to meet the p different parts of the community, some of the power brokers. The Knight Ministries programs have spread around the world, something no one, Reverend Barron's included, could ever have predicted. The most important thing, he says, is to get people involved. Uh, some people come up and say, you've been doing this for 30 years, and uh, boy, I admire you. Well, I don't know. I, if, if, if they should admire me or not, I, you know, uh, I've enjoyed this. I've, it, it's really been theologically important for me. Uh, it's uh, good for uh, all the people who've been part of it. Um, and if we can do that in, in, in more kinds of ways, I think that's a big step for us as, as well. When I started with the Knight Ministry in 1976, my board of directors presented me with a unique assignment to go out at night to the late night bars, all night restaurants, and along the streets to counsel folks. I met individuals in very personal kinds of ways. My mandate was to encounter them on their turf, to help them by bringing counseling to them instead of waiting for them to ask for help. When working up close with homeless youth, the problem sometimes seems too monumental, too daunting, a task to even know where to start, so many with so little hope. Yet, Benjamin Franklin was left his father and brother when he was 17 years old and after a life as a homeless runaway youth, he became one of the founding founders of the United States of America. The Knight Ministry offers its programs to help the disenfranchised of our society. Lincoln Academy has chosen to celebrate these programs through the Lincoln Laureate Program. I am proud to have been a part of the Knight Ministry for so many years, and I thank you for this prestigious award. Thank you. Richard H. Moy is the founding dean of the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine in Springfield. In the 1960s, Southern Illinois University was exploring the creation of a new medical school. Dr. Moy's concern for teaching meshed well with the university's desire to train primary care physicians for underserved communities. In 1969, Dr. Moy was asked to lead the founding of the new Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, and on January the 1st of 1970, he began his appointment as dean of a medical school that existed only on paper. At the SIU School of Medicine, Dr. Moy developed a teaching model that concentrated less on scientific disciplines and specialization and more on organ systems and holistic care. He promoted hands-on teaching by using patient models to help with medical students' diagnosis and listening skills. It was a model that revolutionized physician training, not just in the United States, but in medical schools around the world. Chancellor Simon, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard H. Moy. One of the reasons that I wanted to have a community-based medical school was that the example for the students would be doctors who were successful in their private practice. The strict full-time faculty 
when I was a student intern and resident made it clear they would make rounds three times a week in the morning and only wanted to see the interesting patients. Now how is that for a model? As a medical student in the 1950s, Richard Moy began developing some strong opinions about improving the quality of medical education. The Naperville native believed the system placed too much emphasis on preparing students to pass their medical board examinations without developing the clinical and interpersonal skills they'd need to practice medicine in the real world. The uh, impersonality of the traditional medical school uh, irritated me. Uh, when I was a student, the interns and residents would refer to the liver in room 14, the lung up in 318, things like that. They were simply reflecting the models that they had seen. Dr. Moy began laying the foundation for what he would later accomplish at Southern Illinois University when he was named chief resident at his alma mater, the University of Chicago School of Medicine. As chief resident, I started inventing courses and changing the uh, conferences. Uh, I invented a course for senior medical students because there the, the senior year had no inpatient experience at all. It was all outpatient. And these people were going to be interns the next year. And they hadn't started an IV in 12 months. So I started a sub-internship. And it was a big hit. Southern Illinois University was gearing up to build a medical school in the late 1960s. Dr. Moy was hired as the first dean of the SIU School of Medicine in 1969. At 38, he was the youngest medical school dean in the country. The primary reasons were the lack of primary care physicians in smaller communities and the, the maldistribution of, of doctors. Uh, even those we had clustered around sophisticated hospitals and metropolitan areas. And uh, it was a mantra we all had. The purpose of the SIU School of Medicine is to assist the people of Central and Southern Illinois to meet their health care needs. This, we kept this before us because while many of us had a strong agenda to reform medical education, we knew what brought us here and who was paying the bill. Under Dr. Moy's leadership as Dean and Provost, SIU developed teaching hospital relationships with Memorial Medical Center and St. John's Hospital in Springfield. He oversaw the creation of a centrally controlled medical curriculum that included the medical humanities. Dr. Moy recruited teachers who shared his passion for changing medical education. The unknown for me was were there kindred souls around the country, and fortunately there were, um, had the same frustrations. And so the first chairman that we recruited, each one of them was a master teacher and had been frustrated that these things were not requited. They had done it the, the, the traditional way. They'd got, become professors and, and such. But we all rallied around the fact that we really wanted to create an exciting environment where the students would be having fun and experience the drama of learning medicine instead of sitting in a lecture hall with a clipboard. One of those kindred souls was neurologist Howard Barrows. At the SIU School of Medicine, Dr. Barrows pioneered a teaching model called problem-based learning using simulated or what are called standardized patients to help teach students diagnostic and listening skills. He invented this when he was uh, on a faculty in California. He was a neurologist and they didn't always have patients in the hospital to demonstrate what he was teaching the students about. So he trained his nurse to mimic Parkinson's disease and various kinds of palsy and things like that. She became very good at it and she herself became a professor of education at school in Canada. Problem-based learning is a real-world approach to medical education and it has revolutionized physician training throughout the United States and around the world. And with our standardized patients, it's a person you can talk to. They have a, a history, x-rays, laboratory tests, and do it the way doctors do it. Here's a whole person. We have to figure out what's going on here. Well, then you use the faculty as consultants. And you begin to teach others in your group. And what, as you well know, if you have to tool up to teach something, you remember it far better than if you're sitting passively in that lecture hall with a clipboard. This got a lot of national attention. And then our people got being elected to offices in the educational divisions of the Association of American Medical Colleges. And probably the, the biggest coup was when uh, the medical school in Geneva, Switzerland, recruited one of our professors 
to start the Department of Medical Education and introduce problem-based learning. And when her dean became uh, president of the university, he saw to it that the ideas began spreading around Switzerland. And uh, so that, that's probably one of our more notable international impacts. Dean Moy's remarkable 24-year tenure was marked by innovation. The medical humanities were introduced to the curriculum. The med prep program was created to bolster the ranks of minorities and women in medicine. SIU pioneered advances in Alzheimer's disease research and laid the foundation for what is now the university's new Simmons Cooper Cancer Institute. But SIU never lost sight of its core mission. And since its founding, the School of Medicine has graduated more than 2,000 physicians, with nearly half of them serving in primary care settings. The high point every year for me was commencement. So it always pleased me, these bright young people that uh, had done so well and were going off to great residency programs, and each year a lot of them going into primary care, which is what we were all about. Uh, that, that was the, the high point for me was uh, commencement. Medical schools are very relatively unpopular with university presidents. They're very complicated. They get into all sorts of things. They demand a lot of special handling through the years. And uh, when you're starting one, all of this comes in about the same time. And in the first years, I had many, many requests that I'm sure the president found annoying and irritating, particularly when he had to take them to the board of trustees. I was in Carbondale once, and I thanked the academic vice president for how flexible and supportive they'd been through the years. And he said in his soft Southern Illinois accent, well, Dick, the president and I have talked about that very topic. And we came to the conclusion that you know more about medical schools than we do, so we'll keep doing it your way until you blow it, and we'll fire you. <laughs> you brave faculty, splendid staff, pioneering students, residents, graduate students, researchers, community physicians, our distinguished teaching hospitals, this very supportive community of Springfield, and my wife, Carol. I guess we didn't blow it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Academy. Born in Culver, Indiana, William A. Asborne is the chairman and chief executive officer of Northern Trust and has secured the company's place in the global marketplace, even as he has led civil and philanthropic efforts in Chicago. A thorough knowledge of Northern Trust and its 117-year history, coupled with a keen business sense and an eye to the future, guided his plan to lead Northern Trust into the worldwide financial network, even as he has kept a steady eye on the bottom line. He has encouraged a corporate culture that value civic involvement. In 2005, Northern made its single largest do donation, $3 million, to the Chicago Public Schools. Bill leads by example. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Science and Industry, Northwestern University, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, which he will soon share. He serves on the Board of Directors of Northwestern Medical Healthcare, sure Chicago Urban League, the Chicago Horticulture Society, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, New Schools for Chicago, <clears throat> the Renaissance Fund, Executive Club, the Economic Club. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, William A. Osborne. The people were terrific. Absolutely terrific, very genuine, took a real interest in me as an individual, and I, I really uh, thought that maybe this is a place at least to begin my career. William Osborne applied for a job at Chicago's Northern Trust Bank in 1970. He was fresh out of the Army with an MBA from Northwestern University. Over the years, Osborne advanced through a variety of leadership positions at the Northern Trust, culminating with his being named Chairman and Chief Executive Officer in 1995. I was very lucky uh, at the beginning. I took a job in what at that time was called the Bank and Corporate Services Division. Uh, some would refer to it as the cash management area of the Northern. 
And we were one of the leaders in working with large corporations in, in determining ways they could they could accelerate their cash inflow through uh, through a technique called lockboxes, and they could use control disbursements, and they could learn how to manage their cash, the movement of money in and out better. And so, I got in again at the ground floor of a business that really took off. During his tenure, Osborne has transformed Northern Trust from a regional bank into a global banking and financial services corporation with international offices in North America, Europe, and the Asia-Pacific region. We've really focused on what we do well and what we do differently than others. And that's allowed us to really evolve through a really changing financial services environment, one where there's been a lot of consolidation. And what's happened is in the global custody business, which we are a major player in, we have been able to really take what we have developed initially domestically and move it around the world as those markets have changed and the investing patterns uh, have really broadened in various countries around the world to include investments around the world and the need for our services. So our globalization really has followed the needs in our and, and then the clients that we have and their needs. Osborne credits the company's success to creating an environment where people believe they have someone who listens to them. You're better getting the views of everyone and, and creating an environment where they feel comfortable in, in really giving and in sharing in their, in their attitudes and views, not only about the company, but about the environment that, that they're in about how the clients are being served, whether there are suggestions on what we can be doing better there, what products and services we need going forward. So listening to your own people is, is a great place to start. Just like the Northern Trust, the United Way is dedicated to the highest absolute quality and service to its clients. You can help people rebuild their lives. Osborne has encouraged a corporate culture that stresses philanthropy and civic involvement. The company donates 1.5% of its pre-tax profits to charities every year. We have a, a business model that really focuses on the community. Uh, and our private banking business, of which we're one of the really leaders in the United States, uh, part of what we want to do is get close to people in the community. Uh, and by doing that, we were able to establish a reputation as an organization that cares. Cares about our employees cares about our clients, cares about our shareholders, and cares about our communities that we're in. And our people, that, that, those values of, of how you care really resonate well. And it, it allows us as an organization to really, I think, penetrate in and, and really get people to understand the value of giving back. Because it's really, it's a wonderful trait. A recent $3 million gift to the Chicago public school system supports literacy efforts, the development of new schools, and expanding learning opportunities. But it's more than just money. Northern Trust employees spend time in the classroom with children as mentors, tutors, and guest speakers. Our people are out there helping to tutor young kids. Uh, they, they, will, they will get involved in the school programs, and, and many times it might be online. They'll go on an online system in the afternoon and, and really go back and forth with the kids and, uh, and then meet with them, you know, maybe once every quarter. But they, the, the kids get to know the tutors through, through the computer. And some of them go actually right in front of them. So it's, it's a part of really, really engaging and helping out. And education is the most fundamental need. Osborne believes in setting a personal example and lends his time and expertise to a wide variety of civic institutions and charitable causes in the Chicago area. Like Northern Trust, the United Way is committed to providing services that help people concentrate on the important things in life. If I'm not involved uh, with organizations that are important to the community, how do I expect others to be involved? Uh, I don't really want to ask anybody ever to do something that I don't wouldn't do. In fact, that's one of the things I learned early on, and I've done about everything. So th the reality is, is that I've been engaged with a lot of organizations around the city that have been important uh, in terms of making Chicago a, 
a great place, not only in, in serving some of the underserved or dealing with education, but also dealing with how do you make Chicago a better place for all to, to really be a world-class, top-notch city. And the museums, the cultural side, education, whether it's a university or whether it's high schools and, and grade schools, those are all important facets, and I've been involved in that. Healthcare. Uh, another area that I've been in, involved in in a major way. So I, I try to spend time. I've added th these over the years. I can do this and manage a number of uh, different requirements, I think, out there and do it in an effective way. Every day we receive more information and have new experience in all our lives. It is how we shape these experiences that make us who we are. It is the connections we make in life and the interpretations we derive from our experiences that make us leaders. I've traveled the world in my business activities, and I believe there is no place like Illinois. Our state is unique because our leaders in the academic, not nonprofit, health care, business, and cultural arenas are simply unparalleled in their determination to make Illinois a great place to live, to work, to raise a family, and more importantly, to make it a place for everybody to be successful. That can-do spirit of these people is contagious, and I made Illinois my permanent home so I could be part of this enthusiastic community. I've been very blessed to have so many people guide me, inspire me, and help me along the way. I thank you very much for this wonderful honor. I appreciate it. I will strive to do my best to keep Illinois such a rich and wonderful state. Thank you. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, Gary Wills is a prolific author, historian, and cultural critic whose many lucid and insightful essays and books have illumined our present by explaining our past. He earned his Ph.D. at Yale in 1961 and presaging a predilection for wide-ranging research and commentary within a decade had pub published books on Roman culture, race relations, the assassin Jack Ruby, and Richard Nixon. Wills has addressed the political, religious, and social issues that sometimes divide but oftentimes unite us. Every few years he has written a book on the Founding Fathers, and every decade or so, a study of a U.S. president. More recently, his books have focused on religious and moral issues. Philosophy, politics, morality, and theology often intersect within the few pages of his many essays. Especially appropriate for today is Lincoln at Gettysburg, the words that remade America, won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 1993. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Gary Wills. I read so much that uh, when my father thought I was, there's something weird about this, so he said, uh, I'll pay you whatever it was, the dollar, two dollars, something, not to read any, any book, reading any book for a week. So I said, okay, and got the money and bought a book. Gary Will's childhood love of reading led to a lifetime of scholarship and writing, characterized by its intellectual rigor, clear prose, and thorough knowledge of history. A Jesuit high school gave him a solid foundation in the classics. So Jesuit schools... High schools were taught not by priests, primarily, a couple, but by scholastics, people training to be priests. They would take out three years from their studies. So they were in their 20s, and, uh, you know, they would play ball with us, and you know, they were very energetic and curious in the middle of their own studies. So they set up extra things if you wanted them. Uh, we could, you know, I had somebody give me a, a little course in Aristotle's Poetics uh, because we were reading a Greek play. 
And I admired the scholastics so much that I wanted to be one, so I went into a Jesuit seminary and then left because I found out celibacy was not the life for me. Wills taught at Johns Hopkins University in the 1960s, but found a growing audience for his articles for the National Review, Esquire, the Atlantic Monthly, and the New York Review of Books. It was a very exciting time, and I covered a lot of riots. I covered a lot of uh, 60s events. Uh, wrote a book about Jack Ruby. His political writings during the 1960s earned him a spot on Richard Nixon's enemies list. He was jailed for an anti-war protest at the United States Senate. That was a protest that about a hundred of us did, uh, petitioning for redress of grievance, according to the Article One uh, to the First Amendment, uh, telling the Congress to stop funding an undeclared war. And uh, so we went, and we we went first to the Senate. And we jammed ourselves in the doorway and said we were not going to leave until they stopped funding the war. Uh, and so we were there for a couple of hours, and the police came and took us to jail. Wills continued teaching, coming to Northwestern University in Evanston in 1980. Thus far, he has authored more than 30 books, including biographies, history, and religion. The nation's founding fathers are a favorite subject. John Kennedy asked Arthur Schlesinger, how did so many geniuses show up at the uh, Constitutional Convention? And uh, I've always answered that, that these guys had a monopoly on all the knowledge of their time. And it was a, a body of knowledge that one person could really aspire to master, that, you know, a Jefferson or a, a Franklin or a Benjamin Rush or Adams could know a little bit about almost everything and quite a about, lot about some things, science, agriculture, religion, philosophy. Uh, you know, when you consider when they rode into Williamsburg for state days in Virginia, colonial Virginia, these were people who ruled realms and hundreds of souls under their governance. And everything on that plantation was under their supervision. They had to be the health and education and welfare and uh, economic planner and architecture uh, commissioner had to do all of these things. And it was very hard, and not too many people succeeded at it very well. So we don't have the equivalent of that, and we never want it. We, we don't want to go back to that time. Slavery was a very important part of that. You know, they couldn't have done that unless they'd had slaves. Will's 1992 book, Lincoln at Gettysburg, The Words That Remade America, won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 1993. He knew that getting the meaning of the war right was just as important as winning it. Uh, and that's, of course, what is so great about the, the Gettysburg Address. It's about the meaning of the war, whether this kind of government can survive or will it perish from the earth. Uh, and the and the way he sneaked into the Constitution, all men are created equal. What he did is make the Declaration of Independence our founding document. Lincoln always admired the Declaration. Although, you know, we all do. We read it on the Fourth of July, etc. Uh, but he had uh, a very deep sense of its meaning, and thought that the Constitution should be read in the light of that, that that was our, he had took transcendentalist language, that was our ideal toward which the Constitution was striving, approximating, but that didn't go all the way. And we still have to carry on the work that the Constitution started out, but this stays steady, this ideal up at the top. Uh, so in a way, people left there with a different Constitution. Uh, that's how powerful that speech was. Wills does not shy away from controversy, especially when it comes to his examinations of religion in contemporary life in books such as What Jesus Meant. He said there's only one test. Uh, he said, when it comes, do you want to be in the kingdom of heaven? Which he is. And they said, uh, well, how do we know? And he said, the judge will come. And he will look at some people and say, welcome, welcome into the kingdom of heaven. 
And they say, why are, why are we chosen? He said, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Uh, and then he'll turn to others. And they, oh, then they say, where are you? I didn't see you. I didn't know I was feeding you. And he said, whatever you do to the least of my followers, you do to me. Wills recently retired from teaching, but not from writing. More books and articles are on the way. And writing is fun for me. I never, I've never had writer's block of any sort. Uh, it takes time to go, collect the material, and I have to often travel for that. But uh, the writing itself, I think, is probably the most rewarding. I've always had a kind of honorary pantheon of great Illinoisans. Lincoln, of course and his partner, General Grant, Jane Adams, Governor Altgeld, and his law partner, Clarence Darrow, Cardinal Bernadine, Studs Terkel, and the other laureates. He is a laureate, you know, it's in, the, it's in your program. He's known for wearing red. So I said to him, did you really go in white tie? And he said, yes, but I wore red socks. <laughs> I really feel honored to be a partner with Studs in this and with my honored fellow laureates. And I now really feel at home in Illinois. Thank you. Born in China, Cho brothers Shanjo and Da Wang are internationally acclaimed collaborative artists who since making their home in Chicago 20 years ago have created some of their most celebrated works and have generously supported local artists. The Cho brothers overcame a youth marked by oppression and government persecution to emerge in the 1970s as not just among the best known abstract artists in China, but also cultural leaders. The brothers painted their first collaborative work in 1973, working together and communicating through a dream dialogue of some simultaneous meditation. They employ several media, paint, sculpture, and performance to create, create abstract pieces that blend Eastern and Western art traditions. Their collaborative works have been exhibited across the country from New York to Los Angeles, as well as in Europe. The Cho's presence in the Bridgeport neighborhood, famous as the home of several Windy City mayors, has reinvigorated the area as an arts community. Their Cho Brothers Center is dedicated to furthering awareness of other cultures through art. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you as laureates of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, the Cho Brothers. This one is called Chavo Euro. It's our self-portrait. My brother and I, you know, we were active in the 90s, back and forth in Europe many, many times. And this piece, the large piece here, it's called Traveler. But there, there are a lot of time the painting is more like a, our a diary. The Diary of the Jill Brothers is a mesmerizing blend of what one critic called a continuously evolving mix of Neolithic iconography Eastern calligraphy and landscape painting, and Western art tradition. The Zhou brothers, Shan Zhou and Da Wang, were born into a family of scholars and academics who gave them a childhood appreciation for China's 5,000-year history of fine arts and culture. I mean, in our family, we have a lot of uh, huge, important art collection, like many painting and calligraphy from 14th, 15th century, and and um, we get that kind of, you know, infant, like the, only one thing is eternity. There's the human, the create, creative talent and spirit. Like many educators and artists, the Zhou family was sent into exile during the Cultural Revolution. But the brothers were always encouraged to express themselves and develop their artistic talents. They created their first collaborative painting in 1973 a deeply personal work called The Wave. This is more like the very realistic painting. It's a sea 
uh, like the landscape seascape and in the big ocean. Actually, that is more like our self-portrait at that time to represent our where will be our future and how can we reach our dream and goal. I think the first painting when we make together is in some very special situation. Uh, we did not plan it, just happening. We did not really realize this, the first painting we did together reflect to our life and career, being out together. We go through all the journey uh, together in art for more than 30 years. The Zhou brothers work only in tandem in a process they call a dream dialogue that does not rely on verbal communication. It's a kind of simultaneous meditation directing their movements in sculpture, painting, and painting performances. Dream dialogue is like the dialogue is in dream. It's sometimes you have a very understand uh, clearly a response, but sometimes it's not. You know, it's like floating in a dream. And this kind of collaboration is exactly have this kind of feeling. Same as like some kind of like, like the music performance, like jazz music. They don't really know who going to start first and who when they're going to start. And then the painting for our collaboration is something like that. Using the painting language, we talk to my, my, myself, talk to my brother, what I feel, what I... Uh, all the, you know, just conversation, but is using the painting language. The Zhou brothers became an overnight success in China in the post-Mao era, winning the national prize for the avant-garde from China's Ministry of Culture in 1986. Worried that another political shift could just as easily end their creative freedom and wanting to share their work internationally, they came to Chicago in November of 1986. We start in Chicago with speak no English, and we came here with my brother with $30 and, and then two suitcases come to Chicago. But I think, you know, the city give our a lot of excitement. Right. And then the passion of love and then for the, the future desire to make our, you know, continue our career. And then we create a painting with my brother, the big painting called Dream of Chicago. That actually is a self-portrait in that time. We believe we will make everything happening here from start, the, like the brain canvas. We will draw the a dream there. The brothers set up studio space in a former community center in Chicago's Bridgeport neighborhood and later purchased an old warehouse that has become the Zhou Brothers Center. The Zhou Brothers Center provides exhibition space and affordable studio space for emerging artists. It's art at its finest. You've got a, a wide variety of different artists from different areas, uh, emerging artists, established artists, and you know, right now I'm working with established artists right now, just doing, helping them out with other programs and paintings and Watching the brothers work, it's, it's really amazing. And the fact that they give back so much, it's, it's incredible. I think this, uh, the Joby Center development, we find out is very exciting and important. And then we, we, we've talked about this. We would like yeah. to uh, create another in same institution in China and also in Berlin. And that's, then we can bring, they, you know, uh, have a, better exchange uh, program, and then can also better discover all the different talent. The Zhou brothers continue to find new audiences for their work around the world. At 30 feet in circumference, the recently completed Ring of Life sculpture in Switzerland is their most monumental work to date and brings together past, present, and future. The Ring of Life is, uh, is represent you know, the, the life of a human being is a positive, it's always everything is back to the circle. Uh, we feel a dream is just like started, but in the other stage, but all the thing happening in the past, but much more exciting for the future. Our first painting 
created the first painting together is more than 30 years ago in a village, small village in southern China. We give it the title, The Way, and it shows a tiny bowl with two figures in it. Against, the figure is against the high wave and trying to reach the shimmering city on a distant horizon. It seems against all art. We have reached the city and it has since been our home for the past 20 years, Chicago. It was a new beginning for us to come to the United States and become the citizen of this great country. It was a new beginning for us when we met so many new people here and in Europe. Thank you to all of our friends and supporters that have made it possible for us to succeed. We hope to be able to celebrate many more new beginnings and that our life and art will have an impact on the future generation. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Colonel Jill Morgenthaler. I am privileged to represent Governor Blagojevich tonight as we honor six men for their dedication to humankind. Gary Wills is a writer, historian, and critic who engages in political, social, and religious issues. In light of this evening, his book, Lincoln at Gettysburg, The Words That Remade America, is very apropos. He enlightens the reader by explaining how Lincoln used the Gettysburg Address to make the Declaration of Independence paramount. Now, we all know that Lincoln was poor, self-taught, and yet he achieved greatness. And the Job brothers, their lives are similar. They grew up in an impoverished village, and with no art teachers, they taught themselves art. And after coming to America, they found freedom of expression, settled in Illinois, and achieved greatness. Dr. Richard Moy once said, regardless of what you think you will be doing 10 years from now, you are now preparing yourself for something that will probably be far more exciting. He revolutionized medical schools by teaching doctors not to sit at the microscope, but to sit beside the patient. And the result was a daring and caring medical school. And Lincoln also said, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphans. William Osborne understands these words. He has fought for the widow and the orphan and the unemployed and the uneducated. And with heart and generosity, he has transformed lives. Reverend Thomas Barons has spent countless nights ministering to the homeless, abused, and neglected youth. The Reverend seeks to give every child a sense of worth. He has said, we feel it is even more important than before to reach out to those who are disconnected, helping them get back on their feet. Reverend Barron's light has illuminated thousands of young lives. To close, I will let President Abraham Lincoln have the final word. I leave you, hoping that the lamp of liberty will burn in your bosoms until there shall no longer be a doubt that all men are created free and equal. God bless the laureates. God bless the great state of Illinois. Chancellor.